Uh, if you could just raise your hand this morning. Who has ever messed up before? Can you raise your hand? Yeah? If you want to look around the room, you can find out everyone that's messed up before. And let me just uh, let you know, spoiler alert, everyone has, including myself. We actually mess up a lot, and we mess up uh, throughout our days more than we realize sometimes. And, and it's easy for us to pick up on, on messes because we are one right? It's easy to see when someone else is messing up. It's easy to see when someone else has failed, when else someone else has, uh, has come short, because we kind of do that same thing all the time. So we're going to skip through these real quick. We've talked about the path fire induction work beat today and uh, skipping into our, our sermon. And so um, we, we talked about last week, if you weren't here last week, we talked about that, that we either were a mess, we are a mess, or we're one dumb decision away from a mess. It's almost inevitable in the life that we live, in the world that we live, to avoid messes and avoid difficult situations. And, and when we do get caught, right, when we get our, our hand caught in the cookie jar, we kind of look around and we say, well, no one's what? No one's perfect, right? No one's perfect. And so we, we acknowledge that there's this standard somewhere out there that we can't meet the standard that we can't complete, that we can't perfect, but we continue to strive after it for some reason. We continue to strive after it and pretend that we can do it or, or we lie to ourselves and, and we want to believe that we can. And it's not only for those that are Christian and aren't Christian. I think it's everyone, whether you believe in God or you don't, we have this idea that there's a standard that we can meet and so we're always going after it. Um, and so we talked about last week that when we do recognize that our life is a mess, that we've been in a mess, or a mess, or one decision away from being a mess, we're that much closer to being with God. Because God cares about our mess, and God interacts with our mess. And the reason that Jesus came to the world was because we were a mess, and we needed someone to get us out of it. And so last week we talked about the important topic of grace. We talked about how important grace is in our lives and how God wants to interact through this word. We don't deserve his forgiveness. We don't deserve his presence. We don't deserve anything he gives us. We deserve the complete opposite because we're a mess, but he gives us grace. And so because God so loved the mess, the world that is a mess, he sent his son Jesus to die for us on the cross. So every time that you are in a mess or coming out of a mess or going into a mess, remember, God cares about your mess. His, matter, his mess matters to you because he sent Jesus to die on the cross with you. He's never going to leave you in a messy situation alone. And so we're talking about what it means to follow Jesus. As Christians, we talk about what it means to follow Jesus and what that looks like. And, and, and I don't think following Jesus is about following rules. I don't think it's just about rules, and I don't think it's just about knowing the right thing, right? Many times we get stuck on that and say, if I, if I just knew the right thing, right? If I just knew the right day, if I just knew the right beliefs, if I just knew the right commands, if I just knew the right thing, then maybe I'll be okay. The reality is that, is that, is that if we become rule followers or rule keepers, at some point, we're not going to meet the standard. At some point, we're not going to do it right. At some point, we're going to forget about one. At some point, we're not going to come through to the letter of the law. And so I don't think it's about following Jesus, it's about following rules. It's so much more than that. Also, following Jesus, it's not just about being forgiven. Uh, many times we say, okay, Jesus is grace and he is love. All I have to do is come to Jesus and ask for forgiveness. And yes, Jesus is there to forgive us. And yes, Jesus is there to give us grace. But many times we get unstuck in that cycle of just doing the same thing over and over and over again and saying, well, Jesus will forgive me. It's going to be all right. And I do believe it's going to be all right. But following Jesus is more than just receiving forgiveness. As a matter of fact, many times we believe that when Jesus forgives us our sins, uh, the Bible says actually in the book of Micah, and it also says in the book of, of Psalms, that God takes our sin and he puts it in the furthest parts of what? Of, of the ocean or the sea, right? He puts it in the furthest part. Now, we've taken that text or those texts and said, well, that means, therefore, that God forgets my sin. He erases us from his thoughts. Now, the Bible doesn't say that. I personally don't believe that God is capable of forgetting things. Okay, we have, we have a story in the Bible that we probably all have heard before, the story of David, right? Now help me out, why, why is David so famous? Goliath. Goliath, very good. What else? Psalms. Writing Psalms, what else? 
You guys are so nice today. It's Saturday, right? I'm going to be very nice to David. <laughs> what else do we know about David? <laughs> Bersheba and, and killing and, and lying. And there's a long list, right? Now, did God forget his sin? He forgave it. Did he forget it? I don't think he forgot it because it's in the Bible. <laughs> if God just reads the Bible, he'll read the list of sins again, all right? It's there. So, so I believe God forgives. He doesn't forget. And so he doesn't forget because he's not capable of forgetting. He's not capable of forgetting how I mess up. And that's not the point. The point is not just to delete my history. The point is that God wants to engage with me and live day to day with me. He wants to forgive me of my sins, but also help me grow out of my sin, help me grow out of my mistakes, help me grow out of the messes that I get stuck in. And so God remembers, but it's more than just forgiving. It's more than just forgetting. It's more about what it means to be in a relationship with Jesus. And so today we're going back to the book of uh, the letter of of Philippi, the letter to the church of Philippi, the, the Philippian letter that we found in the New Testament. And last week we mentioned that the apostle Paul wrote the letter. He had started this first church. It was the first European church. It was located in Greece, what's known today as Greece. And he writes this letter to this church because he had started the church. And so he planted the church and about 10 years later, he writes them a letter. I don't think it's the only letter he wrote, but it's probably the letter that got copied the most and was preserved through time and God wanted that letter included in what we call the Bible today. And so this letter of, of, of the Church of Philippi, we remember that Paul writes this letter, he's in jail, he's probably not comfortable, he's probably on the shortage of food, he's probably in the shortage of sleep, he's probably not being able to do everything he wants to do, he's limited in his activities, he's limited in what he's able to, who, who to communicate with, and so he remembers the church of Philippi, and he writes them a letter, and so we're going to go over some of the same text we looked at last week to extract what God wants to share with us today on this topic of following Jesus. So Philippians chapter 1, verse 3 to 5 if you have your Bible with you, if not, you can follow on the screen. Paul says there, I thank my God every time I remember you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Okay, so Paul's in a mess, right? He's in jail, he's limited, he's in chains. And as he's in chains, he's beginning to remember every single church that he's planted. He's beginning to remember every experience that he's had with new believers. And as he remembers the church of Philippi, he smiles, right? So how could you smile when you're in a tough situation? Paul is doing it. Now, why is he smiling? He's smiling because not only is he remembering the church that he, a church that he loves, but he's smiling because this church has partnered with him for the sake of the gospel. This is not just another church. This is not just another congregation. This is not another church of believers or followers of Jesus. This is a church that is gospel-centered and that it's living God's love out as Paul is living it out. So what does that mean? It means it's a church that not only preaches the gospel, it's a church that lives out the gospel. You see, it's one thing to say I'm a Christian or a follower of Jesus, and then once a mess happens in my life, you know, that's out of the picture now, I'm focused on how I get myself out of it. It's a completely different thing to say I'm a follower of Jesus, and when the mess comes, I will still be joyful, I will still be happy, I will still be a partner with Jesus for the sake of the gospel. This is not just lip service, this is sacrificial love. Every time that we're called to follow Jesus, it requires that we give up something of ourselves. Now, we have nothing that we could offer God that is of worth, but God desires our hearts. And when we give our hearts to God and we allow the gospel to be in our hearts, we begin to partner and joyfully give of ourselves away, even to the point of death, because we know that that is what the gospel requires. Paul's happy because he says, I'm in jail, but I know if you guys were in jail, you'd share my joy and you'd share my passion for sharing Jesus with others. In the same way that Paul was joyful about his church, I'm joyful, I'm thankful for our church, right? We get to meet every Saturday and we have so many people that serve on our church every single Saturday to make church happen. We have our volunteers and people serving in our kids' ministries, right? Can we, can we pause right now and thank them? Yeah? Can we give them a hand? 
We, we also have deacons that come early and make sure that the building is, is, the building can't be turned on, but the lights are turned on, AC or heater are turned on, that our signage is out, that everything is set up. And so can we give our deacons a hand this morning? We also have people that greeted you this morning. They're here super early, right, to, to, to be together and spend some time to get our debrief about the day and make sure that we're at our doors checking kids in or welcoming everyone that comes in through our door. So can we thank that team this morning? So that's a lot of people so far right now, right? Yeah? Okay? Not a lot of people? Yeah, it's a lot of people. We also have people that are in that booth back there that are here every Saturday to help us out, making sure that my microphone works, the screen works, that the, all the instruments work, that the sound sounds good in the building and online. We have worship teams that practice throughout the week to make sure that when they lead us in worship, everything is at a, at a high, high level. And so can we thank all those people that serve in that capacity? And that's just Saturday. We have ministries that meet Saturday afternoon. We have ministries that meet during the week. We have life groups that, are, that have been meeting for several weeks now and volunteers and people serving in those capacities. Last Saturday, we had lunch after church and we had a team that orchestrated that. We have a Christmas program that's gonna be amazing coming up. There's a ton of people working around that. And so I love my church because we have Jesus in our hearts and we wanna serve. But we also want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to serve. We have everyone that has an opportunity to step in and to partner with the gospel because there's nothing better in this world than partnering with Jesus and sharing good news about who he is and what he can do in our mess. You see, you have neighbors, you have coworkers, you have friends that are in a mess, coming out of a mess, or about to step in a mess, and they have no hope that in their mess, they'll be able not only to get out of it, but they'll, that they'll be better through it. And we have something good to share. We have a story about a man named Jesus who, can, who came to a world that was messy, and he got messy so that we could have hope that not only can we get through our mess, but we can actually be stronger because of the messes that we create or the world brings in our lives what if we were partnering in every single area of our life with Jesus and the gospel the good news of who Jesus is what if at home you were partnering with Jesus and the gospel in your marriage to every day have that sacrificial love towards your spouse or towards your children or towards your parents what if we had this partner gospel mentality with our neighbors yeah, even the neighbor that brings uh, their dog over to your lawn and then doesn't pick up. <laughs> I have a couple of those. Fantastic neighbors. I'm praying for myself and for them. What if that coworker, right? That coworker that doesn't do their end of it and because they're not doing their end of the job, then you're having to do more or stay longer. How about that relative that always says that one thing that gets under your skin? What if we were partnering with the gospel in every area of our lives? Paul's in jail, and he's writing to a church that's not in jail. But as he's suffering and in a mess in jail, he's saying, I'm thankful. Every time I remember you, you're bringing a smile to my face because I remember that you're not only preaching the gospel, that you're living it out. And this wasn't just any church that was living out the gospel. We talked about it last week. This is a diverse, probably the most diverse church in the new world that has people that are freed and slaved, uh, people from all walks of life, rich and poor, people that, that have connections and no connections, and they're sitting shoulder to shoulder worshiping God, not because they intentionally wanted to do that, but because they lifted up Christ, people came to their church and started worshiping in a way that society and the culture had never seen before. So this is the type of church that God desires, the type of church that Paul is recognizing during this time. And so he's excited about his church. He goes on in verse 6 and says, being confident in this, that he who began a good work in what? All right, we're going to change that right now. You're going to help me out. I'm going to say a little bit louder. I need your all's help. So we're going to say, he that began a good work in me, okay? In me, in me, in me. All right, ready? He who began a good work in me. Yeah, me. God began a good work in you. The moment that you started believing in Jesus, the moment that you started coming closer to God, God began a good work in you. 
All right, so it's important that we highlight the in because many times, as we said in the beginning, we think the work is outside of us, right? I need to change the way I dress. I need to change the things I say. I need to change the way that I behave with others. I need to change the way I react. And that's all exterior stuff. And we're big, big, big on the exterior, but God is saying, I'm not doing a work outside of you. I'm doing a work where? Inside of you. God is working in your heart because he wants to do something different. Not different as the world different, but different in God different. And that work doesn't start on the outside. It starts on the inside. So it's like when you, um, for those that are dating or married or have been married, you know when you first saw that person, right? You started feeling things where? In, on the inside, right? So when you, when you see someone you like or someone you feel like you're falling in love with, you don't start saying, oh, I need to change this, 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 and this. You start feeling stuff that motivates you or creates a desire in you to be a better person, not because you're wanting to change the outside stuff, but because something inside of you is driving the change. The same way with God, when we fall in love with God and God has fallen in love with us, there's something happening on the, out, on the inside that he's working on that will carry it on to completion until the day of Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus is saying, the moment that you started to believe, there's this change that started inside of you, and it's going to be ongoing until I return. In other words, you're going to be a bit of a mess. But it's a mess that's under construction for a little bit. And it's okay if it's under construction as long as construction is happening, right? Um, I remember in, in college we had, we had this uh, neighboring town, and every time I had to go to the neighboring town, it was about every Saturday where, where um, the theology department had us go to this small town and knock on doors and try to get Bible studies. And um, I don't know why they had us do that because for the last 30 years they had done that, and it was about a town of 30 people. And so we were knocking on the door to the same 30 people every single Saturday for 30 years, and, and they knew we were coming, so nobody was opening the doors. Um, <laughs> But anyways, we would go. But on the way there, before we got to that small town, there was a bridge that was under construction, but it wasn't really under construction. There was just a sign that said under construction. So the first day I went to the town, I said, oh, it would be awesome to have this bridge finished because when it's finished, then I, we won't waste 20 minutes going all the way around this little body of water just to get to this tiny little rink-a-ding town. And so I, the first time I saw the sign, I was like, this is exciting, federal government, Argentinian government under construction. I said, this will probably get done in no time. It's a small bridge. No time. So the first Saturday we went, went back home. Next Saturday we went out, signs still up there. I looked around, nothing's changed. I said, well, maybe, you know, they're on vacation. <laughs> They'll be back next week, get it done, no time. We will we'll save some time. Nope. So nothing happened for the second week, third week, fourth week, second month, third month, fifth month. I went nine months to that town and not one stone was moved. It was a sign that said it was under construction, but there was no construction happening. Now, I don't think that that's the type of work that God does. I don't think that God slaps a sign on us and says, you're a Christian, you're under construction, and eventually, eventually, you know, your thoughts will change. Eventually, your feelings towards so-and-so will change. Eventually, you know, you'll have the type of sacrificial love. I don't think that's the type of work that God does. When God begins something in us, and we believe that he's doing something in us, he does bring it to completion. It's for his purpose, and it's not necessarily behavior modification, it's life transformation. You see, God doesn't want to just change a part of you and continue going about life the same way you always have done it. He wants to change everything about you. He wants to change the way you think, he wants to change the way you talk, he wants to change the way you walk, but it starts in the, in the heart, and he does the work. So are we letting Jesus transform us into who he wants us to be? Are we allowing him to change the, the, the parts of us that we don't like sharing? Are we allowing him to work with our mess ups? Are we allowing him to work with our, with our strength? Are we allowing to have full access of our lives? So Paul continues and he says, and this is my prayer church. I'm gonna pray for you and I'm gonna pray for the entire church and the community and I just have one prayer. Now if you just had one prayer, if God said, I'll give you one prayer, and that's the only one you get, 
what would you pray for? As a matter of fact, just think about it for a second. What do you pray for every day? If you pray in the morning when you wake up, if you have your devotional your connection with God, what do you pray for? If you're praying during work or on your way back to home or with your kids, what are you praying for? So it's a good thing we're not writing out our prayers and everyone, the whole church is reading them. <laughs> in this case, Paul is. So we'll see what Paul writes about. He says, I'm praying that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. In other words, what Paul is praying for is that previous text. Paul knows that God is doing a work in the church and every single believer and every single person, and he's saying, I'm praying that God's work may be completed in you, and this is what God's work is all about, that his love may abound more and more in the knowledge and depth of who he is. You see, many times we want to get close to God and we feel, oh, I just need to read the entire Bible. I need to read every single text. I need to study every single text. I need to read about and know everything the Seventh-day Adventist church believes and every single bit of information. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. We should read and study the Bible. But that's not the work that God is doing. It's not based on what we're capable or wanting to do. It's based on his purpose. And so John tells us that God is love, and he can't change who he is. And so if God is love, and the God that is love is doing a work inside of me, then maybe Paul is right in saying that the work that God is doing in me is about his love abounding more and more and more and more in my life. You see, it's only God's love that can mature our faith in God. It's not going to be more knowledge. It's not about finding the right thing to do. It's about allowing God's love mature in our lives. So you might be asking, well, what does, what does this look like? I think we all know at least one person in our lives that has a love that's matured in a mature, a love that's sound in their lives. We all have one person that we know that when they're going through stuff, when they're going through a mess, it seems like they're not going through a mess, Right? That one person that we look up to, that one person we admire, that one person that we talk behind their back, no, not that part. That one person that we think about like, man, their faith is strong. There's that one person that we know because their love has been matured in Christ and, and no circumstance or situation is going to move their faith. It's not going to shatter their faith. It's, it's not going to change who they are. When we allow God's love to mature in us, not only do we become more mature Christians and growing in God's love, not only are we going deep and wide, but we're also more secure about who we are. We're more secure about who we are. So when someone says something bad about me, or when someone talks behind my back, or when someone doesn't like something that I like, or like something about me, it doesn't faith me. It doesn't move me. Because God's love is telling me every single moment of every single day exactly who I am, exactly how much Christ paid for on the cross, exactly how much the Godhead, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are working for the sake of not only my salvation, but for the salvation of the world. So in moments of weakness, in moments of doubt, in moments of criticism, in, in moments of, of anger, I don't let that change who I am because I am safely secured in Jesus' arms. This is the type of Christians that Jesus wants for his church. He wants Christians that are growing and abounding in his love more and more and having more knowledge and more insight, not only in his word, but especially in how we share his love with others. I think that the measure of maturity of any Christian is not how much they know God, it's not how much they pray. It's not how much time they spend at church or serving, but how well they love others that are different than them. When we're capable or willing to love those that are different than us, that means that God's love is abounding more and more and more in us. And as God's love abounds more and more in us, not only are we being grown and stretched out, but we're capable of, of housing even more of God's love to be able to spread it out to anyone in our lives. 
Paul continues and he writes up this section with the following words. He says, so that you may be able, you're having all this love to be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Jesus Christ. It's in our love for Jesus and growing in that love for Jesus do we mature our faith. Mature to the point that we are discerning, listen to this, what's best. Not discerning what's good, not discerning what's right, but discerning what's best. And this is probably the most challenging part for anyone. Not only knowing what's best for me, but knowing the best way to love someone else. I've taken this text before and I've said, okay, I can, I, I can try to love others, right? I can try to do what's best for others. But every time I've looked at this selfishly and just focusing on my, what I can do versus what God wants to do, I've tried to help others with what I thought they needed. And usually what they need is what I think I need. So we try to make everyone like us, right? If they're going through a tough time, we give them what we need when we're going through a tough time. If they're mourning, we give them what we need when we're mourning. If we're hungry, we give them what we eat when we're hungry. If we're thirsty, if, we're, uh, if we need clothes, if we're going through a tough situation. And so we're constantly giving out out of a selfish desire to meet our needs as we're trying to meet our needs. But Paul is saying something different. Discerning what's best comes out of having God's love, and it's not what's best for me. It's what's best for the other person. So the perfect example of this is God. When Adam and Eve sinned, when they broke that covenant, that promise with him in the garden, after God had created the perfect environment with perfect food and perfect bodies and perfect present and future, no messes. And when they messed up, God could have done what he needed. He could have said, I don't need a mess in my record. I don't need this little stain here that planet Earth has created in my beautiful masterpiece of the universe. You know what? I'm just going to delete this planet. I'm just going to erase it, pretend it never happened. No, they, won't, they won't affect any other universe, any other planet. No one will have to ever hear this story. We'll just sweep it under the universal rug. But God didn't do what was best for him. He did what was best for Adam and for Eve. You see, in that moment, Adam and Eve didn't need someone to preach to them about how they had messed up. In that moment, Adam and Eve didn't need someone to create more guilt and shame in their lives. In that moment, Adam and Eve didn't need God to show up and say, I told you not to eat from the tree and scolded them for it. He didn't do any of those things. As a matter of fact, we, we see God doing exactly what Adam and Eve need, even when Adam and Eve reject exactly what they need from God. You see, we see God showing up as this paternal figure and trying to put his loving arms around them even though they have pushed him away and sinned against them. Not only do we see them coming after them and searching for them and just trying to see what's happened and trying to understand from their perspective and why they went a different route, we see Jesus giving up the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate act of love and giving what's best. You see, Jesus doesn't give up an angel. He doesn't give up another created being. Jesus gives up his son because it's only his son that can cover their mess. It's only Jesus that could take their place and their sin and their death and their life and make it new. And so in that best, he creates something pure and blameless, not only for that day, but for the next day, the next day, the next day, until Jesus return. See, the same way that Jesus gives us what's best, because it's coming from the Father's love, because it's never ending and never ceasing, because it's all forgiving and all gracious and all loving, he wants his followers to exhibit and live out the same type of love. Look, church, there's, there's people in your life right now that I know might be very, very difficult to love. There might be someone right now that you're at ends with that you can't see eye to eye on, that you can't have a conversation with, that you're just opposite on every single topic that the world has ever seen. It might be someone that's in your home, it might be someone that's in your neighborhood or workplace or someone online, and you're doing everything to cancel that person, block that person out, snooze them out, because you just don't want to deal with them. But what if their mess is something that God wants you to love. 
What if God has put that person in your life for a reason so that you will discern what's best and pure and blameless for them? So if we just take a moment to think about how God interacts with our mess, how God is so gracious, forgiving, and loving when it comes to with our mess ups and our tough situations, I think we would have a different set of eyes, a different heart, different types of actions towards those around us. And so maybe you're saying, you know, Pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm a hot mess. I, I can't even deal with myself. How am I gonna deal with somebody else's issues? I have a prayer for you that we can wrap up with today and that you can pray every day. Now, it's not a, a Disney prayer. Uh, there's gonna be no magical thing happening in, over you or outside of you, but I do believe the Holy Spirit's gonna work in you. And it's a prayer that we're taking from Paul. We're gonna say, Jesus, can you say that with me? Jesus, complete your work in me. Easy prayer, you can remember that prayer, memorize that prayer and pray it every single day. Jesus, complete your work in me. I'm gonna leave a, a, a moment for you just to close your eyes and to pray that prayer today. Jesus wants to complete his work in you today so that you can help someone else come to that same realization that God is doing a work in them. And no matter the mess that they've created or the world's created, God loves our mess. He sent Jesus to die for our mess so that today we could have hope. Jesus, complete the work in me today. Amen.